there's much disagreement over its characteristics you know there are questions is it as sturdy as an alliance or is it as flimsy as a marriage of convenience certain factors innate to the china russia relationship drive them apart but the two are currently glued together by their shared view that the us poses a threat to their core interests there's one more factor which you know brings china close to russia and that okay. is xi jinping's russia complex when china looks at russia you know it sees it as a country which is torn between great power ambitions and weak capabilities it talks about respect for all countries sovereignty because it wouldn't want you know its own sovereignty to get impacted the way russia impacted ukraine sovereignty so which is why it's giving out this sort of a narrative you know it will not ban but domestically it's you know uh, fueling nationalism by saying hey look we can also do this to taiwan but externally it is very cautious it cannot lose western markets um it cannot have the same kind of things happening to its own breakaway regions um and it knows that you know western sanctions could impact its economy so beijing is watching this very closely because it is or it understands that there is a possibility that the kind of actions which countries of the world are taking against russia these could be the exact ones they take against china if it were to attack taiwan even though china keeps uh constantly drumming up this uh, the kind of devastation it can unleash on taiwan the fact is that there's a huge military gap with the united states and okay. the people's liberation army still lacks the means and the know-how needed to uh, make <coughs> good on beijing's uh, these reunification threats so okay. xi jinping uh, wants to maintain stability before okay. this falls 20 20th party congress when he will assume a once unthinkable third term as party secretary if heavens forbid there were to be an attack on taiwan the sanctions probably would not be as severe but even if there was to be a relatively mild sanction china would not be able to digest even that okay um, good day to everyone so um, the russia ukraine war as we see is causing untold repercussions not just in europe but across the world many say that the war will result in a changed world order given the weak leadership in the us and the rising china some opine that the russia china friendship will endanger other democracies in the region especially india that's something india has to be uh, very very about so to discuss this and other issues uh, we are fortunate to have dr sriparna patak uh, associate professor at the school of international affairs of op jindal global university she is an expert on china its history and has written extensively on it welcome dr sriparna thank you so much for having me in this very interesting session welcome thank you so we'll start so one of the aspects of the russia ukraine war that is seldom debated in the mainstream is the role of china in the war or at least the you know uh, things surrounding it so uh, for the benefit of our uh, viewers uh, dr shipana can you please elaborate on the current russia china ties and how china is looking at this war so you know um, when we are talking about russia china ties especially in the current frame of things one thing which has been repeatedly mentioned is this joint statement which was released by vladimir putin and uh, xi jinping and this was during uh, putin's visit to china um, this was the first time that she met with a foreign head of state since before the pandemic that statement between uh, you know the two countries they seem to signal an increasing alignment between the two powers against the us and its allies because they said that you know nothing is outside the scope of this uh, friendship based on that document one could assume that china would be supportive of russia's assault on ukraine yeah. but the truth is very different you know the nature of china russia relationship has been difficult to define and there's much disagreement over its characteristics you know there are questions is it as sturdy as an alliance or is it as flimsy as a marriage of convenience the truth is that the relationship between these two is neither and it is both you know this is because of an alignment and misalignment of different areas of these two in different uh, aspects so certain factors innate to the china russia relationship drive them apart but the two are currently glued together by their shared view that the us poses a threat to their core interests an accurate assessment 
of you know the depth of the strengths of the weaknesses of the china russia relationship is therefore important to understanding where these two you know converge and where these two do not collude in international affairs see china and russia differ fundamentally in their visions and approaches to the international system their alignment is precisely because of their shared anti us agenda um, and their leadership preferences but china's assessment of the long term prospects of a china russia friendship is not glorified as you know one would assume so even in china mm-hmm. there are bear huggers and there are bear critics both of them have the same assessment that russia is a destructive power and that you know there's a difference between russian and chinese goals and approaches to the international system prior to 2014 you know when the crisis uh, over ukraine began china and russia had a very lukewarm relationship 2014 was designated by chinese government as a year of abnormal acceleration of china russia relations this acceleration needs to be qualified because see china has not recognized russia's annexation of crimea still around okay. that time china's strategy or china's anxiety over us strategic rebalancing to asia or russia's fear over nato's expansion these converged so china came up with the statement and the determination that china and russia they have the same kind of international pressures from the us because the us is a bully it bullies it uh, both the countries on a wide range of issues etc the thing is if you go and look back a little bit in history 400 years of china russia relations has taught the chinese that during china's conflicts with the others the russian modus operandi is to maximize its own benefits in the name of okay. mediation and of okay. assistance for china <clears throat> for example russia carved out 1 million square kilometers of chinese territory through its mediation of the second opium war okay. so you know in short okay. as long as the us is the biggest threat to china you know okay. every other goal becomes secondary but okay. long term alignment in terms of words and postures that long term thing is something which is still far away now another thing is that despite this one factor us bringing russia and china together there's one more factor which you know brings china close to russia and that okay. is xi jinping's russia complex so this russia complex okay. is basically a nostalgia and preference for russian history russian culture and this is something which you know uh, people from the generation of 1950s and 1960s have xi jinping is a princeling from that generation and he had all sorts of soviet influence on him so she's okay. russia complex basically is a strong admiration of putin as a strong man leader and okay. he has a desire to be putin spear why does he have a desire because see xi jinping is powerful because china is powerful but if you look at russia and putin putin is powerful even when russia is weak so in chinese popular culture putin is nicknamed the great emperor who is intelligent who is decisive who is manipulative who is powerful that is something which xi jinping desires xi jinping understands if the stability of the cpc is under question then xi jinping will not be desired but putin in any case is always desired so when china looks at russia you know it sees it as a country which is torn between great power ambitions and weak capabilities so judging by just domestic indicators russia is not a great power its economy has stagnated average annual growth is of 1% since 2009 russian economy shrank by 3.1% in 2020 etc etc china and russia differ significantly on in how they view their roles in the international system china is a beneficiary of the international system and you know china has utilized all the liberal norms or all the democratic values and has ensured that its trade is basically what fuels its economic and political rise so china would want that economic order to stay otherwise how does its export reliant economy continue to prosper so xi jinping therefore would want to reform the system he would not want to replace it if he replaces it you know then how does he reap benefits out of you know other countries in comparison Putin calls the dissolution of the Soviet Union a tragedy. He sees Russia as a victim of the yeah. same international system yes. that China has benefited from. So th- this is the divergence between the two. So it's a very difficult relationship and even if you say that you know if US and China were to decouple completely mm. maybe you know um, China could ally more with Russia. Could it really do so? Because you see Russia can play no role in substituting China's losses. in high tech products if say a decoupling were okay. to happen russia's position in the global high tech industry has lagged far behind china for the exception of military technologies okay. if you just look uh, at ukraine after 2014 russia relied on china to import semiconductor chips russia becomes more right. reliant on china right exactly another example 
During the recent US-China trade war, you know, uh, it was hoped that Russian soya beans would make up for China's losses in American soya beans. But China mm. soon realized that Russia's total soya bean production, which is less than 5 million tons per year, yeah. was less than 20% of China's imports from the US. So oh, um, yeah. Russia is not a likely candidate for bigger roles in the future of Chinese economy. The only oh, thing yeah. cementing them is US and, you know, the Western oh. world. But honestly, it's a difficult relationship and there are cracks even in the China-Russia relationship. Yeah, <laughs> that was a very uh, you know, interesting thing, especially the uh, Z's-Russia complex. Uh, that is something very new. Given this uh, background, uh, Dr. Sviparna, somehow conspicuously, the China's official response for the war has been to, you know, kind of encourage dialogue, negotiation between parties. And, you know, it has limited itself to kind of media queries. So the real agenda, you know, seems to be somewhere lost in, uh, you know, transition over to what's happening in Russia. So it is a country which, you know, uh, China aims to surpass US and become a global power and a probably kind of a policeman of the world. But uh, why do we see a subdued China, especially in terms of this Russia-Ukraine war? What's the real agenda here? So, you know, when Russia went ahead and declared war, this was something which Chinese intelligence hadn't informed them about. So even China was taken by surprise. And, you know, as I mentioned, there are several difficulties even in China-Russia relationship. What is China's real agenda here? Because, you know, it's giving very contradictory, you know, if you look at, you know, exactly. its responses, it's not abstain. Yes. Uh, but yes. at the same time, it is, you know, it, it admires Russia. Domestically, if you follow the narratives which China is giving out, it's portraying, you know, Putin's attack of uh, Ukraine as something that is great. And, you know, um, you know, maybe we can also do something similar to Taiwan. So very mixed responses. So it's important here to understand what are the costs to China because oh. of Russia's war against Ukraine. First, there is the question of, uh, you know, the direct cost from Russia's actions. Okay. Russia supported independence for the breakaway Donetsk and uh, Luhansk region. Yeah. Uh, you know, and this complicates China's own position vis-a-vis its minority areas such as, say, Inner Mongolia, whose Mongol majority have ethnic brethren across the border in Mongolia. So then there is Russian President Vladimir Putin's support for 2014 uh, referendums held by separatists in eastern Ukraine. So there is a concern in China that Taiwan's pro-independence forces could also adopt a similar tactic. You know, referendums are common enough feature in Taiwan's political system. And they have been used earlier, you know, in case of uh, issues. So that is dangerously close to what China might have considered as an assertion of independence. So this actually, you know, the um, Russia as an external force interfering within mm-hmm. Russia is something which is not China would want for its own breakaway uh, regions. So there's a okay. first is that particular cost. So what China has done is that uh, it has tried to preempt this by mm-hmm. reminding everyone that uh, whether it's about the most recent situation or the Crimea issue in the past, China has always stayed neutral. It's constantly emphasizing it's been neutral. Claims have been made that, you know, China's relations with the US and EU are much broader. So tensions over Ukraine should not substantively, negatively impact China's ties with them. It cannot lose US and EU as markets. So what China also did, therefore, is that it tried to use the 50th anniversary of US President Richard Nixon's visit to China to underline that US-China relations can still find a way forward from oh, current okay. tensions. <laughs> so um, there, there are these headlines. China handles complex Ukraine crisis with caution. You know, they are constantly urging for dialogue and consultation. So these are the okay. political costs which might right. come to China. Then there are economic costs. China yeah. is Ukraine's largest trading partner, a position which belonged okay. to Russia till about 2019. And Chinese corn imports from Ukraine are not okay. insignificant. They're quite high. Chinese companies are also likely to be impacted by Western sanctions against okay. Russian entities. Okay. So, by refusing to directly criticize Russia, China mm-hmm. can find its space for maneuver, limited by greater expectations from Moscow. So, therefore, for the most part, China's MOFA, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, has tried to respond to questions on Ukraine by saying legitimate security concerns of any country should be respected, or things like, you know, quote unquote, a complex historical context and complicated factors are at play. It talks about respect for all countries' sovereignty because it wouldn't want, you know, its own sovereignty to get impacted the way Russia impacted Ukraine's sovereignty. 
so which is why it's giving out this sort of a narrative you know it will not ban but domestically it's you know fueling nationalism by saying hey look we can also do this to taiwan but externally it is very yeah. cautious it cannot lose western markets it cannot have the same kind of things happening to its own breakaway region and it knows that you know western sanctions could impact its economy so it is playing very smart this is the real oh, agenda yeah. that answers that uh, question of uh, you know china's agenda you know before coming to uh, taiwan you also mentioned that the chinese companies would be hit by the sanctions on uh, russia you know the just the other way around you know uh, western sanctions have targeted russia to you know plethora of economic and political sanctions uh, what are the ways in which these sanctions could benefit china so see especially uh, the economic you know uh, in terms of uh, you know international banking system payment systems or it could be loans so uh, is there uh, several things which where the sanctions can actually benefit china that's the question so it would not see china in the current uh, position that it is you know in if you see uh, the gdp announcement it's the lowest since 1991 right okay. now china cannot have any sanctions or anything um, you mm-hmm. know which would hamper its further economic rise uh, because china mm-hmm. is too deeply intertwined with the international economic system so for example you know um, a the question always is that if heavens forbid for china you know if there are similar sanctions on uh, on china its future or further rise would be stopped you know china has stated its opposition to western sanctions on russia but if you look at the ground facts it has offered put in no sort of help china has also put on hold lending to russia from oh, the okay. asian infrastructure investment okay. bank which it dominates and from the new development bank of the brics grouping china is the world's biggest trader and buyer of crude oil and china has been hit hard by the economic sanctions unleashed on russia over its invasion of ukraine okay. even chinese government officials have begun to predict economic difficulties on the horizon you know uh, commerce minister wang wanthao he said at a recent press conference that this year the pressure on foreign trade will be huge and the situation will be very severe the current sanctions regime has pushed the prices of crude oil up this will result in a heavy financial burden on china which is the world's largest um, oil importer economic restrictions might also affect uh, this 147 billion dollars uh, trade between china and russia fund transfers to russian entities can no longer occur in us dollar terms uh, the currency of choice you know is still uh, even though china would want an internationalization of its own yuan the currency of choice still you know 86% of international transactions still take place in the us dollar chinese companies with operations in the us or the eu may fall victim to secondary effects of sanctions if you know parent corporations in china maintain business links with russia so chinese firms are caught between a rock and a hard place at the moment they have not been able to seek any leverage out of these sanctions which is why they are trying to oppose the sanctions they would not want their own economic rise which is tied to that of us or of europe or of russian oil imports to you know come crashing down yeah, that was very informative mm-hmm. there was some um, you know kind of debate going online especially saying that china uh, will mm-hmm. benefit a lot but thanks to your clarification uh, it's not really the case as what is debated on the social media time so um, yeah i would uh, like to go to the next aspect the military aspect of uh, russia ukraine war so uh, now we see a uh, lot of sanctions on russia and lot of countries the nato and other countries uh, you know kind of uh, coming together uh, against russia what are the chances that china taking a cue from russia or this war you know could invade taiwan which it, it has always been threatening to do and and that, that's one part the second part is in case that scenario happens china in really invades taiwan would the world really come together in support of taiwan the way it is coming together you know to support ukraine what's your take on this so you know ever since the conflict or the war in ukraine started Taiwan has been on guard and president Tsai Ing-wen has stepped up surveillance against yeah. PRC's attempts to you know ape a Ukraine in Taiwan mm-hmm. see China if it goes for a military conflict in Taiwan an actual mm-hmm. military onslaught it will have to bear heavy costs um, as you know as this unfurling situation in Ukraine is going to be something you know which is already impacting russian businesses or russian economy so beijing is watching this very closely because it is it understands that 
there is a possibility that the kind of actions which countries of the world are taking against Russia, these could be the exact ones they take against China if it were to attack Taiwan. See, the US and NATO have not come to Ukraine's aid the way it was envisaged. But Western arms transfer to Ukraine cannot be ignored. Also, scores of foreigners are traveling to Ukraine to join the resistance. You know, that cannot yes. be ignored. The severity of the sanctions imposed on Russia cannot be ignored. Even though China keeps constantly drumming up this uh, the kind of devastation it can unleash on Taiwan, the fact is that there's a huge military gap with the United States. And okay. the People's Liberation Army still lacks the means and the know-how needed to good on Beijing's uh, these reunification threats. So okay. Xi Jinping wants to maintain stability before okay. this fall's 20, 20th Party Congress, when he will assume a once unthinkable third term as party secretary. Okay. And there are some, you know, voices of dissent within the Politburo as well. So he would not want any sort of instability. Certainly, China has stepped up its incursions in and around Taiwan's airspace. But okay. these provocations do not signal a near-term invasion. These, okay. in, these operations are to rather stoke a domestic nationalism, you know, and okay. these, correlate, okay. these often correlate with important symbolic anniversaries. For example, the PLA dispatched a record of 80 fighters and bombers into Taiwan's airspace last year in October to mark mm -hmm. China's founding. Yeah. Other incursions were aimed at discouraging Taiwan from embracing policy positions which are not acceptable to Beijing. Last week, Chinese fighters um, entered uh, Taiwan's airspace after uh, President Tsai Ing-wen voiced her support for Ukraine and other Taiwanese politicians. The fact, however, is that mm -hmm. because Xi Jinping would not want instability before the 20th party conference, and also another reason okay. is okay. that weeks, if not months, will be required to position Chinese forces and various logistical elements at you know pre-identified staging areas along China's coast. So these Herculean efforts pale in comparison to the immense difficulty China's military will face in safely okay. transporting its forces to the limited oh, number okay. of uh, suitable okay. Taiwanese landing sites. There are limited number of Taiwan, you know, landing sites. So mm -hmm. China will have to make preparations for this. China right now is in preparations for the 20th Party con Congress. Okay. So what also complicates China's planning is that mm -hmm. its military has not experienced anything resembling combat in more than 40 years. So that's the principal reason why China has sought Russia's counsel as it devises okay. workarounds to the, um, and other sorts of challenges. Um, you know, more broadly, Beijing could have hardly predicted this overwhelming international response to Russia's incursion. Mm. Frankly, no one did. You know, the severity of Western sanctions imposed on Moscow, cutting down Russia's central bank from the global finance, financial system. This is without precedent. Western mm. sanctions, you know, with uh, export controls are wreaking havoc on the Russian economy to the point that Russia may fully never recover. China cannot afford that. You know, okay. Europe and EU, they are also going to suffer, but they appear to be prepared to absorb the costs associated with such mm -hmm. harsh measures, even at the expense of their own economic growth. So these are things China cannot afford. So in my view, Taiwan is not Ukraine. You know, Taiwan is also already pretty prepared itself. And China is not Russia. Rather, it cannot afford to be Russia because the costs imposed by the West will be too huge for a China which wants to continue economically growing. I mean, just a corollary uh, to this question. Uh, see, uh, hypothetically speaking, you know, even can the West, I mean, in, in a scenario where uh, China attacks Taiwan, can the West afford to itself, you know, impose sanctions? Because the West, uh, the economy of the West was not really dependent on Russia. But it's not the case with China. Uh, you know, it's, uh, China is a factory of the world, you know, it manufactures the products of the West. So in case, you know, a uh, scenario where China attacks Taiwan, the, can the West really afford to uh, impose such sanctions uh, they, the way they have done with Russia? Can they do it with China? They cannot. Uh, West also is uh, equal, equally reliant on China. So which is why, and, you know, see, the West has had ample number of reasons if it wanted to impose such sorts of sanctions. You know, mm -hmm. instead of, uh, you know, constantly just talking about human rights violations in Xinjiang, the murders, the tortures, it would have mm -hmm. done so. You know, um, then the Beijing Olympics, instead of just boycott, right. they didn't you know, do, instead yeah. of, they, did, they didn't do. They didn't. And the clear reason because of all of the reason behind all of this is that the West also is reliant on um, China. So 
if heavens forbid there were to be an attack on taiwan the sanctions probably would not be as severe but even if there was to be relatively mild sanction china would not be able to digest even that okay. Okay. I, and i say this because maybe the west would not attack china the way it attacked russia but you know any right. sort of disruption anything which hits at the chinese economy is something which is not acceptable to the leadership let's take the example of india when we started banning their apps you know the chinese stated that oh indian economy is an economy which we don't really need because you know it represents just 1% of a total trade it is not something which is extremely important to the chinese economy but the fact mm. is they threatened eventually they threatened to take us to the wto for our bans why okay. because it was <laughs> yeah. creating some sort of dent yes. even yes. if it's a yes. small dent a dent is a dent so china cannot afford that which is why it will be careful and it is not as rash or you know hedonistic the way putin is china is okay. a more calculative yes. and cunning power as compared to russia which will go ahead and because it has nothing to lose it's already you know the economy is pretty much destroyed so okay. the only way it can live up the hype is through its political action so china okay. understands that its political power is tied to its economic power so it will calculate very cleverly yeah and uh, that was a very uh, you know very important intervention there with respect to uh, taiwan and china i think we have covered a lot of ground uh, dr suparna finally coming to the india question the question which is there on almost average every i mean every average indian's mind what in the case of india if china you know resorts to further incursions what kind of support india can expect from the international order i ask this because you know many in the west uh, are already commenting that india cannot expect the kind of support ukraine has got because india abstained from voting against russia it didn't not, the west did not get the support from india the kind of support it, it was expecting to the degree it was expect so what kind of support can india expect and you know uh, will the west really come together in case of you know india china if i can, i don't say war but you know uh, increase in hostilities uh, your thoughts uh, dr so you know this yeah. war in ukraine is 64000 kilometers away from india while the unfolding yeah. war is extremely unfortunate we at our own borders have been stuck in a military conflict with china for more than 2 years now the countries which are now asking india to intervene should take a look at how they responded themselves when mm-hmm. china attacked us okay fair enough it wasn't a war but we did lose 20 of our soldiers and we are still stuck in a conflict with the with all sorts of possibilities of escalation the eu stated india and china need to sort out differences diplomatically right. Right. the us while it did issue a statement you know when our soldiers lost their lives um, it did provide us with some sort of intelligence on the chinese pla there was nothing more than that russia also asked india and china to sort out the differences bilaterally so the question is how about practice what you preach secondly india had the maximum number of students stuck in ukraine much more than any oh. other country so our first priority was to save our lives any government the first responsibility you know if you were to compare between acting for the people or engaging in geopolitics any government or any sane scholar would tell you that the first responsibility is towards its own citizens which is what was the most important question for india you know when india realized that you know there's this humongous number of students and they have or the indian people stuck in ukraine and they need to be evacuated india spoke to the ukrainian side india spoke to the mm-hmm. russian side and got yeah. a four hour window you know um and which is why uh, before any other country could do it india uh, indian embassy issued an advisory saying that within the next 3 hours please reach xyz yeah. places and this has to be yeah. done on an emergency basis this was because well india could talk to both the sides had india you know just ignoring its own national interest just gone ahead and done what the western countries had done india would not been able india wouldn't have been possibly able to evacuate its citizens the way it it could you know um so anyway so you know uh, we got this for our uh, window for safe yeah. passage and this is much before you know um, corridors were even being talked about so safety of indian citizens was seen as more important than geopolitical calculations now coming back to geopolitics we rely on russian weaponry how, how can a country currently at conflict with china give up on weaponry would the us fill in or the eu fill in with cheap weapon yeah. exports no no, no way. So yeah. india has to calculate yeah they would not do it so india has to calculate and voice its take on the war in ukraine in accordance with its own national interests see india reached out to putin over the phone even before xi jinping did xi jinping who you know 
uh, has a uh, Russia complex who have who claim to have better ties with Russia, etc. But the first, if you just compare the phone calls, it was first Prime Minister Modi who made the phone call before Xi Jinping did. India also spoke with Zelensky yesterday. Again, way before Xi Jinping did, um, India has been advocating for peace in accordance with its long-held stance in international yeah. relations. See, India has not received anything from the West whenever there has been a Chinese attack. Not yeah. 1962, not 1967, not Doklam, not yeah. Galwan. Yeah. Yeah. India does not even expect anything from the West because we have not really received anything. We have not even reached out for help. India is actively collaborating in you know minilateral organizations like the Quad, etc., for diplomatic solutions to the Chinese threat. But India knows that, you know, um, international relations is such that self-help is the only way to help a country. Every country is, has its own national interests. There are no permanent friends or foes in international politics. Russia is not a permanent friend or a permanent yeah. enemy to India. Yeah. Our own interests are our own national interests. So uh, that has been our approach. And uh, the West will not come to India's rescue. They can issue threats. They can, uh, India has held its ground on its own. And will continue to do so in the face of future Chinese threats. Yeah, that, uh, you know, uh, both kind of exposes the so-called hypocrisy of the West in, uh, when it comes to India's concern. So, uh, thanks for those thoughts, uh, Dr. Sri Parna. I mean, uh, I Thank think you so much. Yeah, yeah. we have uh, covered the Chinese question in the war uh, to much elaborate ex extent. You know, kind of summarize. Uh, you know, you explained how uh, the U.S., uh, Russia and China come together because of the U.S. and how their, uh, you know, interests both uh, diverge at the different points in history. And today, uh, uh, you know, Xi Jinping's Russia complex, uh, you know, the CCP's domestic politics and nationalism, India's calculated response to the war, uh, you know, how uh, countries, uh, I mean, countries respond to in, responded to India's concerns and Self-help is the best way forward for India, or which is true for any other country. So, uh, thank you for this very educative uh, uh, session, Dr. Sriparna. And uh, with respect to China, I think probably we may have to talk again because it's a, a huge uh, topic. So today we focused only on the Russia-China uh, and Russia-Ukraine war and the Chinese question. So, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Thank Sriparna. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, the set of questions were really wonderful. And it's always a pleasure talking to you. So I look forward to uh, being here again and answer more questions on China. Yes, sure. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.